Interstitial keratitis is a pretty uncommon disease entity in my clinic, and I think probably in the United States at large. In this country, the most common causes of this seem to be either herpetic keratitis or syphilitic keratitis. An interstitial disease is defined as a condition in which the corneal stroma is primarily affected and the epithelium and the endothelium are affected, if at all, only secondarily. Now normally what you see, of course, is stromal inflammation with neovascularization and in the late stages of the disease you can see anterior corneal scarring and endothelial decompensation. And we had a patient present to our clinic just very recently with precisely this constellation of findings, stromal neovascularization with surface scarring and deep corneal endothelial decompensation. And I want to show you how we treated this patient with a DMAC. This is the eye as presented on the operating room table. This patient is awake and we're about to begin his surgery with a sub tenons block. And this is my preferred type of anesthesia these days for most of my DMEC operations because it's so quick and so easy and so effective. And you can see that even with a relatively complicated operation before you, you can still achieve quite good anesthesia with a sub tenons block. Now, importantly, you'll also observe that this is a phagic eye in a young patient, so you ex expect some degree of posterior pressure, which you don't want to compound by giving a big bolus of anesthesia posterior to the eye. So in my experience, I found it useful to deliver a minimum amount of sub anesthesia, and specifically, I used two cc's of lidocaine mixed with marcaine, and that seems to be very effective at adequately anesthetizing the eye, while at the same time not over-pressurizing the posterior globe. Now to begin the surgery, what you'll see is I use a took blade just to debride the corneal epithelium. And I'm trying to just feel around here to identify more or less what this opacity is truly like. And the goal here is to get a tactile understanding of this lesion. And this is something that I learned from my dad. He really impressed upon me that you get decisive information about what's going on by just physically touching the eye. It can be with a cotton swab or a Wexel, but in this particular case, I'm using this took blade just to sort of pick around here at this anterior lesion. And I feel this sort of rough, irregular surface, and I'm just sort of brushing at it with this took blade to try to understand what the layout of these fibers are. And I'm careful, and I'm deliberate, and I'm exploratory, and as I fast forward the video just through a few minutes of me picking around here what I want to show you is down here inferiorly as I start to pick down here infrotemporally I start to discover right here that it turns out I'm able to find a plane which is quite a bit deeper than I would have otherwise expected and much more peripheral. In other words, it's into what appears to be clear cornea away from this scar. But as I explore this area, I start to discover there is a plane of scar tissue where this lesion originates basically at the infrotemporal limbus. And once I identify that plane, I'm able to pull this scar up here with these tooth forceps. And you can see what an enormous difference in the clarity, the transparency of the cornea you make even before the endothelial operations here, those procedures are done. So once you have a plane, of course, this scar is tenaciously adherent to the underlying corneal stroma because there's been an inflammatory reaction brewing here in this eye. But with sort of assiduous, careful effort, you can see I just gradually managed to peel this thing free with some tooth forceps coming around from all sides. And this thing, even though it emerges as a plane from the underlying anterior stroma, it is basically riveted to the surface of the eye. It is struck, stuck extremely tenaciously. So I'm just being careful and I'm pulling with quite some force, eventually able to yank this bundle of scar off the surface of the eye. 
And there it is. And I think that is the first component of addressing this eye because interstitial keratitis can result in anterior scarring secondarily as well as endothelial decompensation. So once we have the anterior surface here cleaned up, we can move on then to, um, this is a mitomycin soaked sponge and I'm applying it just to try to minimize a sort of reactive scar or haze that would form in the aftermath of this operation. This is a soaked pledget and I hold it against the surface of the eye really just for maybe 10 or 15 seconds in order to try to suppress a haze formation in the aftermath of this procedure. So now we're irrigating the surface of the eye and we're ready to proceed with our DMAC operation. And for the most part, this is a fairly standard, straightforward surgery that proceeds much like any other normal DMAC operation would. But there are a few highlights that I want to draw your attention to. So the first is we make just a few paracentesis. I prefer to make three and that enables me good access to the entirety of the eye. I also use an anterior chamber maintainer for portions of the case, and this gives me some flexibility in determining where that AC maintainer will go. So I make these three paracentesis, and then I use this air interior chamber maintainer. First, you'll notice I'm making an inferior iridotomy with a 25 gauge vitrectomy handpiece in the far inferior iris. I prefer a 25 gauge vitrectomy because it fits through a smaller paracentesis than a 23 gauge and it seems to make more reliable iridotomies than a 27 gauge which is so small and nibbly sometimes you don't get a good full thickness iris defect. This is a 23 gauge anterior chamber maintainer with screws it's self maintaining and I can place it in a paracentesis and that keeps the chamber inflated. So now I have the chamber completely filled with air and I'll perform a 360 degree decimeterexis with an inverted Sinsky hook. And I start in the nasal periphery and I strip carefully to one direction and then I go back to where I initiated the decimeterexis and I strip in the opposite direction. So it's more or less two maneuvers to score the decimase membrane 360 degrees around. And even though this is an eye of a young patient that's phacic with high posterior pressure, the anterior chamber maintainer does really quite a good job of keeping the AC formed during this operation. So now I'm starting to peel the decimase membrane up away from where I have scored it. And this is very standard, very routine, very straightforward. And I'm only showing this to highlight one important distinction in how this is done in this eye versus in a normal eye. So first I'm stripping away from the main wound and the paracentesis temporarily, which is often the most difficult place to do the stripping. And then I will do a similar thing from the nasal angle. So here I'm pulling the decimase membrane nasally. And as I start to peel it, what I want you to appreciate is how easy and simple and straightforward it is to draw the decimase membrane towards the center of the eye in every place against the back of the cornea except, except in that infero, in that inferior paracentral location where you have that scarring. What you'll observe here as I try to strip decimase membrane there is that it is tenaciously adherent and will not strip. So I'm avoiding that location, I'm saving it for last, and I will move the interchamber chamber maintainer and I'm redirecting my poles, and I'm trying to wad up this more or less continuous sheet of decimase membrane and to center and strip everything around this inferior scar, which I feel I will just deal with at the very end. So just to solve everything before getting to the scar, okay. So now I have the decimase membrane stripped in all locations except underneath the scar. 
and I'm going to remove what I can. These are coaxial max grip forceps, and I'm grabbing and ripping the decimase membrane off, and you'll see actually it starts to shred when I do that. I leave a big chunk still in the eye because a part of this decimase membrane is still stuck to the back of this scar. So I'm grabbing it and pulling what I can away. And even though now I've liberated about 90% of the total surface area, you'll see this big triangular wedge still stuck to the back of the cornea. And this is fibrotic and thickened and stuck fast to the back of the cornea. There's no way you can peel this just with an inverted Sinsky hook, and you won't even see this if you're trying to strip under BSS or even viscoelastic. So the key to identifying this lesion and removing it successfully is to visualize it properly by doing your decimeterexis under air. So now I'm still going at it with these coaxial forceps and I'm grabbing and I'm pulling. You can see how much force I'm putting against that stuck on area to rip off these tattered remnants of this fibrotic decimase membrane that's fused to the back of the cornea. And as I'm picking and pulling, you'll notice that as I persist, I will eventually succeed in ripping off big fibrotic chunks of the back of the cornea, which are not stromal. These are wads of tissue of basically retrocorneal membrane. So here's a big piece there that I'll lay on the cornea. That was stuck as a layer onto the back of this scar, and you never see it if you weren't doing this decimeterexis under air. So I think that's a major point, is that you want to, in addition to liberating the scar from atop the stroma, in these eyes with interstitial keratitis to really tenaciously remove the scar from the back of the cornea as well. So now the decimeterexis is complete and what I'm doing is I'm hydrating these paracentesis. And the reason is, is that I manipulated quite a lot through them. I was pulling and yanking and twisting the eye and when you're unfolding a DMAC graft, you really want a stable anterior chamber. You don't want the anterior chamber collapsing. So you don't want fluid egress from any of these wounds. So before you inject the graft and do the difficult work of unfolding, you want to make sure you have a stable chamber so your wounds are tight and they are not leaking. And it is worth time investing here in this part of the operation in order to make sure that you're not going to inject a graft into the eye and then not being able to unfold it because the chamber is collapsing. So I've hydrated all of my paracentesis and I'm deepening the anterior chamber to make sure that it will not collapse when I finally inject the graft. Okay. So there it is. The wounds are hydrated. The chamber is deep. They're not leaking. It's holding a pressure. And I feel confident now we can inject the DMET graft into the eye. So we'll move on then finally to this portion of the operation. So here's the graft. It's loaded in a glass tube, which is my preferred means of delivering the tissue in. I feel like it's a little bit more um, of a uh, con uh, controlled um, operation than trying to use an IOL cartridge. This particular tube is made, out of, made from a company called Dork, and I like it because it delivers a minimum of volume of fluid into the eye along with the graft. This Dork tube, D-O-R-C, is very nice because you don't feel like when you inject the graft in the eye, you're also injecting this big bolus of fluid that washes the graft back out onto the, onto the bulbar conjunctiva, so you can inject the graft very safely. So here we are, we're injecting the graft into the anterior chamber, and you'll notice that the graft, once it's in, this is a large graft. This is an eye with basically bullous keratopathy, so we use a large graft to provide lots of cells. I'm checking the Motsuro sign to make sure the graft is right side up, which it is, and then we'll just apply a few little taps on the anterior corneal surface. This is the Dirazomer technique just to unfold that last lingering edge, and you'll see just with basically 15 seconds worth of manipulations, the graft is completely unfolded. 
And I show this because this is a little bit perhaps of an intimidating eye. This is an eye that's had severe herpetic disease manifesting in an unusual way. And you can see even in such a situation where you have got scarring throughout the cornea beneath, on top, above, endothelial decompensation in a young fake patient with posterior pressure, still the DMEC component of the operation where you inject the graft and unfold it is trivially easy to do in the vast majority of these eyes. So I show this because I think that perhaps DMEC has not been all that intently described in situations of interstitial keratitis, but also I think just to continue a series of demonstrations on DMEC in unusual eyes, DMEC in potentially complicated eyes, and to try to make the impression that this is a beautiful operation. DMEC is such an elegant, quick, simple, safe surgery that surpasses DSEC in almost every regard. And even in these tricky, potentially perilous eyes, this is the procedure of choice that I think is the most fun personally to do and provides the best results for patients. So thank you so much for allowing me to extol the, op the virtues of this beautiful operation.